vultures. What do we know about them? They fly. They're bald. They eat dead stuff. And maybe they're a little bit underappreciated. Before we get started today, I'd like to extend a special thanks to Ravensbeard Wildlife Rehab for allowing me to both spend time with and film their resident turkey vulture, which you'll be seeing throughout this video today. Everyone I met there was super kind and even gave me a tour of their entire facility and all their animals, which was really cool and they didn't need to do that, so thank you so much. What blew me away was within an hour of getting to know them, they allowed me into their cage with their vulture, which was just an incredible experience, not something I expected, and honestly, not, not anything I've ever experienced before. So thank you guys so much. I've attached their website below, so please go check them out. They're a very knowledgeable group, and they're all just super kind people. So thank you once again. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, Ravenspirit is yet to give this vulture a name, and they don't even really know whether it's a male or female yet. So for the sake of simplicity, we're going to be referring to the vulture as a him, and my high council has elected to name him Vlad. So that's what we're going to refer to him as, and I would be a fool to go against the will of my high council. Before we talk about what makes turkey vultures so special, let's talk about why they have the reputation that they have. It's three reasons. One is their appearance, two is their behavior, and three is general misinformation about the species. Unfortunately, the first thing we're going to start about in terms of their reputation is going to be their, their appearance. So in comparison to something like a blue jay or a cardinal, I think you'd be hard pressed to find anybody that finds a turkey vulture more pretty looking. They are a hardcore looking animal. That bright red head, featherless, you got these weird chicken feet that can't really lift anything up. Not that they need to, but they can't. And of course, the, the huge black coat of feathers. Now that's not to say their appearance isn't intentional. Let's consider their head for a second. It's bald for a couple reasons. One is thermoregulation. When vultures change their altitude looking for prey, temperature will fluctuate with them. So they need to be able to vent heat and retain heat while they're doing this. Now, their feet also help with this but by being, you know, their weird chicken feet help to vent heat. But with their head, they can pull it close to their shoulders and extend it to both retain and expel heat much quicker than a bird that would say has a full head of feathers. The second reason it's bald is because while having a nice head of feathers is pretty looking, it would definitely get in the way of trying to get into corpses to get to the nice giblets inside of them. That bald head allows them to shove their entire neck into the carcasses of animals they want to eat without worries of getting all the giblets all over them. The red color also has a purpose. It's to signal to other adult turkey vultures that they're sexually mature. Immature turkey vultures actually have a brownish black head, which changes to that bright red color as they age. This isn't unseen in other birds either. I mean, our national bird, the bald eagle, actually has a brown head until it reaches a couple year, years in, uh, in age, at which point it turns into that white color that we're all familiar with. Unfortunately for turkey vultures, it doesn't stop at their appearance, as their behavior can also be seen as kind of icky, since a lot of the time you're seeing them either forming what's called a kettle, where a whole bunch of them circle a corpse in the air, or they're just on the corpse itself eating it, which to a lot of people is just not an appealing sight. <laughs> The third reason would just be complete misinformation. Like uh, a couple of different studies I saw, one from 1920 and then one from 1960, which cited the 1920 paper. Uh, they claim that vultures have occult senses which they use to find corpses. This all just sort of wraps into people thinking that vultures are this death omen because they, they just eat corpses. So that they have this whole aura. And unfortunately, that's not just kind of relegated to select groups. The scientific community also used to spew this, so it's very hard to take papers from before 1980 seriously, because a lot of them from the 60s tend to get kind of ridiculous. Before we talk about this next study, uh, we need to discuss what a cloaca is. So a cloaca is uh, it's a one-stop shop, baby. They do breeding, they do pooping, and they do peeing, all out of the same hole. The reason I've got Frederick on my shoulder here is she's got that too. So reptiles and birds, they both got the cloaca. There we go. There's one study from the 60s that was discussing the temperature changes in a vulture during the day and at night by sticking a probe into its cloaca. And they do this multiple times a day. And the part of the paper that was just the most absurd to me was they would wait till the vulture fell asleep at night. Then they'd run into his cage and shove the probe into his cloaca. And now let's reiterate, they do everything from that hole. 
that that's like getting getting a probe shoved up everything at once like that can't <laughs> that's awful and then they're sitting there and describing that the, the the vulture was was not being very friendly back to them i wouldn't be friendly back to you and then they go on to say oh yes well he shivered when he woke up and his temp his heart rate increased and it's like Dude, yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe it's not because he's cold. Maybe it's because he woke up to a bunch of researchers attacking him. <laughs> Let's take a brief detour to talk about the Peregrine Falcon, spotted here looming ominously outside my sister's college dorm. So this bird in more recent times has been featured in a few documentaries, including Planet Earth 2. This bird has been praised as being an example of adaptation, just, just rapid adaptation to human urbanization. They succeed very much so in areas like New York City where other species may not be able to thrive. They take care of pest species like pigeons and other animals that would normally, you know, annoy people. And they're quite striking. They're really, they're really pretty animals. Now, I'm not saying they don't deserve this notoriety. My question is, what's the difference between a peregrine falcon and a turkey vulture? Both of them provide an ecosystem service. One removing pests, the other removing carcasses. Neither of them are a threat to people or pets or property. And they both occupy their own little niche that is not interfering with other native species. The only real difference is that one is a beautiful bird of prey and the other is an ugly bird of prey. That's the difference. One is just not visually appealing. That's why it doesn't get the notoriety that the peregrine falcon receives. Turkey vulture, got a raw deal here. Planet Earth 3 better have a turkey vulture segment because otherwise this is just complete hypocrisy. Let's really get into what makes them so underappreciated. For one, they have a massive home range. Turkey vultures are a migratory bird, so they're gonna use a massive amount of habitat every year. One study I saw saw a single vulture use over 37,000 hectares of space in a single season, which is awesome because on top of that, there's no evidence of territorial dispute. They're cool with other vultures hanging out with them as long as they can get their food. Turkey vultures also have an incredible olfactory sense, which is just a pretentious way of saying sniff. They sniff good. I mean, if you look at this diagram here from a different study, which compared the olfactory bulbs in the brains of a turkey vulture and a black vulture, you can even see how big that bulb is in comparison to other vultures. They can smell fantastically, and they need to. I mean, when you consider that carcasses are not like a very reliable resource to run across in a certain area, they have to be able to find stuff. And it, they're so good at it, it gets to the point that other vultures, like black vultures, have better eyesight so that they can spot turkey vultures sniffing the carcass. They literally just use them to find carcasses because turkey vultures are so good at sniffing them out. Turkey vultures also have an incredible resistance to toxins that other birds simply don't have. One of the reasons that's theorized for the decline of the uh, California condor species is lead poisoning in their diets. Uh, another ethically questionable study in the 80s. It, the researchers gave turkey vultures over the course of 200 days constant redoses of lead-blazed BBs in their diet, and they found that there was an incredible resilience in the turkey vultures in comparison to other birds. What's possibly the most impressive aspect of turkey vultures is their iron stomach. The reason for turkey vultures being able to eat pretty much anything is twofold. One, their stomach acid has a pH a little bit above zero, and is considered to be a, over a hundred times more acidic than our own stomach acid, supposedly being able to even dissolve nails. The turkey vultures also have an incredible array of microbes present in their gut, which helps them break down anything that could potentially cause them harm. I can remember learning of an instance in college where a bunch of people uh, that were tasked with removing vultures laced a bunch of deer carcasses with arsenic and threw them out in a field, only to have the turkey vultures eat them and fly away having a good dinner and not having any repercussions. I have absolutely no proof of this as I can't find anything online about it and personally have no problem believing it after learning about just how strong the stomach acid in these animals are, is. As we discussed earlier with that peregrine falcon section, turkey vultures have an incredible ability to adapt to human environments. Dead roadkill, dead livestock, and just ample roosting opportunities enable them to pretty much thrive around people. There's one study here that shows turkey vultures roosting in a barn that wasn't being used by humans one winter. It's theirs now. <laughs> That's pretty much how it works. They're pretty good. For the final segment of this video, I just want to go over my time I spent with Vlad in his enclosure. Let's get into it. Personally, I was pretty impressed with just how intelligent Vlad appeared to be in the short time that I spent with him. 
During time in his enclosure, Vlad appeared to be testing my boundaries actively and trying to get a read on me. He'd come within a few feet of me before hopping away and he never really took his eyes off of me for more than a couple seconds. While he's incapable of flight due to a wing injury, I was pretty impressed with just how nimble he was on his chicken feet, at one point running up on a stick to perch above me. Vlad ran to his stick a couple moments after I crouched down in his enclosure in, in an attempt to make myself look maybe less imposing so I, I could get different behaviors out of him. And while I have no way of confirming this, I wonder if this was a dominance display, like Vlad's way of showing me who's boss by running up on that thing, getting above me. If I ever came too close to Vlad, he had ways of letting me know. He let out this raspy hiss, and he'd assume a defensive posture, which was pretty cool. I definitely preferred Vlad's way of showing me I was getting too close over the hawks that he was sharing an enclosure with. The pair of Harris hawks he shared an enclosure with flew back and forth across the enclosure right next to my head, and while they were ultimately harmless and never committed to an attack, I found it very difficult to not flinch when they did it. I knew it was coming, and I still flinched every time. That being said, it was interesting to see just how different Vlad acted around me in comparison to these hawks. Vlad came off as way more curious and honestly straight up goofy at times. The Harris Hawks, on the other hand, seemed to take offense to me being in their space and were really not at all interested in my intentions at all. They just wanted me gone. And honestly, fair enough, I can understand why you wouldn't want this guy in your space. Ellen, the rehabilitator who introduced me to Vlad, mentioned to me that turkey vultures are clowns in captivity and seemed to have a pretty good idea of what's going on. After spending some time with Vlad, I can say I 100% agree with her. Even though he appeared very shy and anxious, it was still very clear to me that he was curious about what I was doing, and it was amazing to see the gears turn in his head as he tried to figure out how to approach me. Thank you again to Ravensbeard for allowing me to spend some time with Vlad. Super fun, super awesome experience. This was a pretty massive undertaking, and it's kind of awesome to finally see it come to fruition and get it out. So thank you guys so much. I'll see you soon. Are you looking for a new podcast to listen to? My recommendation to you is The Big Shoosh. My friend Andrew just started his new podcast here. It's about mental health. Totally recommend you guys check him out. Link to Spotify account. Good luck, Andrew. Wish you guys the best with episode 